our previous session we have discussed uh, about uh, the different philosophies and uh, their application on the interpersonal dynamics and now uh, we will see the specially the Buddhist approach to the MSID that is uh, managerial skills for the interpersonal dynamics is there. So, in this we will talk about the uh, what is the what are the different uh, approaches are there then we will talk about the four noble truths and the fundamentals of Buddhism and basic pillars of the Buddhism and management through Buddhist uh, lens that we will be discussing under this particular session. So, whenever we are talking about uh, in the beginning itself uh, 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 that is the life of Buddha. So, in the case of the life of Buddha that is uh, that is uh, born in the approximately 480 BCE uh, and named the Siddhartha Gautam and uh, the discovery of sufferings uh, that that has been uh, everybody knows that is the uh, he has talked about that is the how we are going to have uh, this uh, uh, learning that is the there are the four, four uh, sufferings are there and at that time it has been uh, the, the uh, mentioned that is the, the Buddha should not uh, uh, go by this particular um, seeing of the sufferings and uh, as, a, as a Siddhartha uh, is not supposed to go and that is about the uh, old age uh, uh, it is uh, there should not be any old man or the or uh, disease is should not be exposed to uh, about the deceased person and the death uh, and, and and the shamanas. So therefore, these are the uh, four uh, uh, the sufferings uh, uh, in which uh, the, the it has been tried. That is the he should be protected from these uh, sufferings. But in that case, we will find that it is in the journey of enlightenment. Uh, he it is that is he has attained the knowledge of the omniscience. That is the uh, but uh, we find that is the yeah Buddha has got this uh, the knowledge of the all the omniscience is there. And uh, uh, after getting this particular knowledge, uh, he has started the, his uh, teachings and uh, uh, getting enlightened to the other uh, um, the public also that is the uh, how we can make our life the more meaningful. So, in, in that case uh, uh, he has tried to uh, in India he spread by the aesthetics and disciples in the 12th century and the Asia is spread uh, through trade and West enters into the 19th century. So, therefore, in that case this was the, uh, uh, the uh, this was the period in which this Buddhism was uh, spread and th there is a scared book that is, that is, that is about the uh, Dipitika and uh, this is the uh, journey. And uh, basically, the four noble truths of the life so where there the life is suffering, causes of suffering is green, uh, greed and uh, design. So, therefore, um, how, how to overcome the sufferings that has been the teachings, the situation of the craving and, and, and the path to achieve this noble truth. So, much confusion is due to the English translation of the Pali or Sanskrit word uh, Dukkha is a suffering. So, life is a Dukkha. So, dukkha, dukkha also refers to something that is a temporary, um, conditional or the compounded of other things. Even something precious and enjoyable is dukkha because it will end. So, it is a wonderful explanation and then in this wonderful explanation he talks about that is the how um, the like when we talk about the happiness right the enjoyable. So, therefore, in that case also in enjoyment also there is a dukkha, dukkha is involved into the sukha. And therefore, in that case because uh, we, we, when you are enjoying, but that enjoyment how long you will enjoy? It will not continue forever, that will be the end and when there it will be end, there will be the dukkha that is the separation is there. So, it is also refers to the something that is temporary, uh, conditional or compounded of other things. So, dukkha is not also permanent. Sukha dukha aate jate rahenge, will come and will go and therefore, in that case it becomes very very important that is uh, this dukha that in this dukha that that is a temporary and very important another aspect that is it is conditional. I always mention that is the any situation which is conditional and as soon as you change the condition situation changes. So, it becomes very much relative. So, therefore, we have to be very careful 
and in the careful in the understanding, careful in the responsiveness, how we should be responsive. Because when Dukkha is temporary, so why to get too much worried about it? Dukkha is conditional, why not to change the condition? As soon as we will change our condition, we will change our mindset. Things will be different. It will different slowly. It will may not change totally, but maybe partially. So there is no point to escaping from the Dukkha. What Buddha has mentioned is that is the because of the Dukkha we should not get the totally demoralized because once you understand it is the temporary and conditional then it will give you courage to face that particular Dukkha. And it is unavoidable. Even if you enter Sukha, Sukha will end. And when Sukha will end, Dukkha will start. So, therefore, in that case, they, they, the Dukkha, you cannot uh, avoid it. It is a part of life. The second Noble truth teaches that the cause of the greed or desire, that is the, what, what is the, uh, uh, second truth is, that is the, what is the cause of the greed or desire. The actual world from the early scriptures is tanha and this is more accurately, and this is more accurately translated as, as a thirst or the craving. And therefore, in that case, that particular thirst is there. We continually search for some outside ourselves to make us happy. Where do we search our happiness? Not within, but outside. So therefore, whenever we search the happiness outside, it itself will cause a problem. But no matter how successful we are, we never remain satisfied. And therefore, in that case, what is required is, that is the, the continuously search is required to make us happy. The second truth is telling us, what we must give up everything, we love to find happiness. So therefore, in that thing, that is the uh, more its attachment we create, more will be the dukkha, more will be the problem. So there should be the attachment with detachment, that you should get attached. It is natural. So, human, it is a tendency of a human being to get attached, but one should not forget it is temporary. So, we love to find happy. The real issue here is more subtle is its attachment to what we desire that get us into trouble. Keep yourself away from the attachment too much attachment and natural attachment yes but when you will lose your emotional intelligence and you will get too much attached for any object then definitely it will invite trouble if you want to spend your life peacefully progressively and positively, then we have to control our tendency to get attached with others beyond the limits. What I feel is if we are having that attachment, it is natural, but there should not be trouble in detachment. Because, why? Because it is temporary. That condition of attachment 
every condition, every phase, every situation in life that is temporary. And therefore, in that case, we have to understand that is we are creating, we are creating a sense of attachment by knowing that one day it is going to be an end. So, when it is ending, you are not into the problem. So, therefore, in that case, the second truth is telling us that we must give up everything we love to find happiness. So, whatever we love, the one day we must give up everything. And therefore, when we give up, our attachment should not be a burden, it should not be a barrier and we have to continue with the service of the society. The third noble truth that holds out hope for a cure that is the cessation of the car craving. The solution to Dukkha is to stop clinging and attaching. But how do we do that? The fact is that you cannot buy an act of will. Because it is very easy to say, a very simple example, a attachment with any object, that will not allow you to get detached. So, you cannot stop, you cannot stop yourself from that attaching. But it is required to do and required to do to be happy, that path. So, on, if you want to run a walk on that path, then definitely in that case, you have to learn to give up your attachment. It is impossible to just vow to yourself, okay, from now I would not crave for anything. Practically, it is very difficult, people do, it is not impossible, but it is very difficult. This does not work because the conditions that gives rise to the craving will still be present. So, therefore, in a given situation, that particular style of craving that will continue. So, because the situation is persisting, the Buddha spent last 45 or so years of his life giving the sermons are aspects of the of four, four, four noble truths. The majority of them is about the fourth noble truth that is the path. So, even if we understand that we should not continue with that attachment, we have to give up the attachment. But then how to do that? Because it, as I mentioned, that is getting Disattachment for anything, that detachment is not that easy. So, somebody should guide us and tell us that is in this world, world of attachment, which is a weakness of a human being, how to go away. So, we search, we search for what? We search for the path, that path has been shown by Buddha. In the fourth noble truth, the Buddha as a physician prescribes the treatment for our illness, the eightfold path. So, if we really want to learn attachment with detachment, so, we have to follow the eight noble path. 
eightfold path. In many other religions, in Buddhism has no particular benefit to merely believing in a doctrine. Instead, the emphasis is on the living doctrine and walking the path, that is how to work on that particular path. Here wonderfully you will find that these noble eightfold path are right view, right intentions, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right concentration and right mindfulness. And therefore, this noble eightfold path will lead us that towards the wisdom. The five precepts of the Buddhism is harming living things, taking what is not given, sexual misconduct, lying or gossip, taking intoxicating substance, example drugs and drinks. So, therefore, we have to prevent ourselves by harming the living things. We should be satisfied that whatever is given to us, we should not have any sexual misconduct. We should not indulge ourselves in lying or the gossips. And no negative intake, that is no intoxicating of the substance. So, basically when we talk about the karma in Buddhism, that is means doing our action, what we have to do, what actions we are supposed to take. In the Buddhist tradition, karma refers to the action driven by the intention, chetana, vivek which leads to the future consequences. What sensitizes us? That we have to see. Those intentions are considered to be the determining the factor in the kind of rebirth in samsara, the cycle of rebirth. So, what will be your next birth? That is the, those intentions, that particular chetna, that will lead. The karma and karma fall are fundamental concepts in Buddhism. The concepts of karma and karma fall explain how our intentional actions keep us tied to rebirth in samsara, whereas the Buddhist path as exemplified in the noble eightfold path shows us the weight of out of the that is the samsara. The basic pillars of the Buddhism are the spirituality, compassion, wisdom and meditation. When we talk about the spirituality, we must prepare ourselves to be capable of manifesting the divine presence. So, there is a divine presence and we are working on that under his guidance. He who experiences the unity of life sees his own self in all beings. Atma so Paramatma and all beings in his own self and looks on everything with an impartial eye. In order to truly make significant spiritual progress, we must be clear, we must be empty of the little self. So, no biasness. The greatest battle is the personal conquest which must happen within. You are not winning over others, you are internalizing yourself. The second, compassion, in Hindi we say Karuna. 
in the essence of the heart sutra his holiness the dalai lama wrote according to buddhism compassion is an aspiration a state of mind wanting others to be free from sufferings it is not passive it's not empathy alone it is more than empathy beyond empathy when you feel concern for others and when you want that other person should not have the suffering so that is a point where your heart is full of compassion and that feeling is not only the helping the others you are feeling the pain of that particular person and therefore in that case that genuine compassion must have both wisdom and loving kindness when you are having that feeling of that loving kindness and with the wisdom it is not that you are emotionally disturbed you are with the wisdom with the wisdom you are feeling the concern for the another person of loving kindness and that is creating to say one must understand the nature of suffering from which we wish to set free from others wisdom free from sufferings one must experience deep intimacy and empathy with sentiments of other beings this is the loving kindness when we talk about the wisdom prajna or panna wisdom is insight in the true nature of reality namely primarily anisha impermanence dukha dissatisfaction or sufferings anatha non self and shunyata emptiness so therefore that is the prajna or the wisdom is inside the truth so it is free it is empty and then in that case when we talk about the mind is everything what you think you become so when you are showing the concern for others when you are having the compassion for others your wisdom says work for others and therefore it it is it 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 is not emptiness rather than it is a full full of the compassion and wisdom both and fourth one is buddhist uses meditation to transform themselves and to move beyond distractions of the world to see the true nature of things so whenever there are the distractions and then we come out and move around with that is the what are the distractions are there so we we go beyond the distractions clinical evidence shows that the mindfulness meditation in which the practitioner focuses on his or her breathing improves cognition and emotional control and can also reduce blood pressure decrease the stress anxiety and depression so when we talk about the mindfulness meditation and so therefore what we do we focus we focus our in and out the breathing system and we try to control our emotions we try to control our the logical and rationality 
and totally focus on our breathing. Then in that case we will find that is it reduces our blood pressure, decrease the stress. We are making our mind empty, no thoughts, totally focus on our breathing system in and in our inhale and outhale. Anxiety and depression will be controlled. Help with the insomnia and even slow the aging of the brain. And therefore, in that case, we find that is the way this meditation that creates a sense of completeness. The three Buddhist personality types stem from the belief in Buddhist philosophy that unhealthy thinking grows from the three primary roots. Why the thought process are poisonous? It is because of greed, aversive and deluded. This type will take up slowly, will enjoy their meals unhurriedly and savor rich and delicious food, will drive through traffic with ease, will sleep well and will seek harmony and avoid conflicts interaction with others even if that means being dishonest. The greed type has a natural ability to appreciate beauty and abundance. This temperament will tend to see the good in others and promote harmony and generosity in relationships. The task for the greed type is to learn to have a wise relationship with desire. So therefore, we justify, we justify that desire and therefore, we get more and more involved into the greed. Our mind, the programming of the brain is set in such a way that is we justify our greed. We say in current time it is desired, but how much is desired nobody knows. But still everybody is after desire. The aversive temperament is characterized by the judgment and rejection. This type will wake up annoyed or anxious, worried about the obligations of the day, will rush through the meals, will feel tense and rigid with timings, will be quick to note and point out problems, will sleep fitfully and may become contentious in interpersonal relationships. So every time judging and rejection. And therefore, always, always in rush. The aversive type has a natural discriminating wisdom and ability to see the underlying truths in difficult situation. This type has a comfort with obstacles and can unite opposing views with the clarity, strength and integrity. The task for this type is to learn to let go of uh, imperfections and appreciates of moments by of joy and spontaneity in everyday life. And then this is becoming the lifestyle. The deluded type has a natural ability to approach situations with a beginner's mind without assumption. And this frame of mind gives rise to creativity, spontaneity and equanimity. The task for this type is to learn how to reel in their minds and pay attention to find a place of the balance steadiness is there. So finally, I will talk about the management through the Buddhist lens. So corporate team building, leadership, personal development, interpersonal relations and employee-employee relationships 
and the stress management and the anger management. So, all these deluded type aversiveness and the greed, this we have to understand and see how we can continue in this situation for the eightfold path. The application of this Buddhism that I will discuss in my next session that is the managerial applications of Buddhism to the Buddhist lens. Thank you.